Okay, so let me introduce our special guest for staying healthy at home gardening today it is Dr. Tamara Rial, PhD. She is also known as Dr. Bug. She works for the MU Extension um, for the Urban West region, and she is the field specialist in horticulture. And Monica helped us to get her here today, and she is going to talk to us about bringing pollinators to our garden and how, to, how we can prepare our gardens for that. So I'm going to turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hold on. There we go. Can I just get confirmation that you guys can see that? We can see it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you again for letting me be here. And thanks even for letting me record this. Um, it's I actually share this uh, to quite a few different groups. And I figured, you know, this would be nice to actually put up on a YouTube channel so that it's more accessible to more people. So thank you again for letting me do that. Uh, also, I hope that you will feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, if you are familiar with Zoom, then you know where that is. If not, at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a icon that says chat and just uh, go click on that. And then there's a place you can just um, send me messages and I'll be checking that throughout the presentation so that we can have this be more of a conversation. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking uh, about native pollinators and also habitat stewardship, and I'm so glad that you guys are here. This is this is a a, a topic that I'm very passionate about. So let's go ahead and get started. Well, kind of get started. I do want you to know that I am going to be asking you these questions later on in the program. So I just wanted to have you kind of be looking for for things that you're learning, and then also something that you might intend to change based on what you learned today. Okay, so first of all, uh, bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, flies, and beetles, they're some of the animals that are providing ecological services to over 85% of the world's flowering plants. And they're also important in about 35% of global crop production. So about every third bite that you take, um, that has had a, an insect pollinator. And, and while the European honeybee is a significant managed crop pollinator, native pollinators are as important as ever to the future of agriculture, providing and protecting native pollinator habitat, including the foraging and nesting sites. This is going to reduce some of the negative impacts to, to the, these underappreciated but very beneficial insects. So pollinators, they're the essential workers in the storyline from flowers to fruit, and they make sure that we have a huge variety of, of food. When you look at this picture, all of the food in this image is dependent on bees. It's pretty impressive. So the plants that pollinators, um, they, they they also create food for many other animals. Insect pollinated berries, seeds, and um, and other other things that you can see, the, these are these are food for many of our wildlife species, including bears and rabbits, squirrels, foxes, deer, skunks, chipmunks, many different kinds of birds. Um, it's it's a it's very important for them to have this food too, not just us. So the plants that pollinators pollinate, they also can assist with soil stabilization. So for example, willow shrubs and trees, they help stabilize riverbanks and pond banks and stream banks. They have separate male and female flowers and insects transfer much of that pollen. The plants uh, pollinators pollinate also contribute to stable plant communities and species continuation for plants and animals. For example, the wildflowers in the prairie that you can see, by pollinating these plants, the species are able to continue propagating. The animals that depend on food produced by these plant species are also benefited by the pollinators work as well. So briefly, let's review what pollination is. In short, it's the transfer of pollen from one plant to another. It's important to note that pollinators aren't doing this out of the goodness of their heart to just bring us you know, food and happiness to all. Rather, it's more of a happy accident, a positive but service resource mutualism. Who are the pollinators? We have bats and butterflies and birds. We have moths and, and flies, beetles, wasps, small mammals. But most importantly, we have 
bees. So they visit flowers, um, all of these uh, visit flowers to drink nectar or feed off of the pollen and, and transport those pollen grains as they move from spot to spot. So why do we talk about bees so much when we talk about pollinators? It's because bees are the workhorses of the pollination world. They are the main pollinators by far. So in contrast, lepidopterans, they collect nectar for food and wasps and flies and beetles, they're, they're pollen feeders. And many other pollinators, they may be accidental pollinators because they happen to be on a flower where pollen sticks to them and then they move to another flower where some of the pollen rubs off. In contrast, bees actually spend their in, almost their in, entire adult lives collecting pollen to provision nests for their offspring. So to aid in this mission, bees are hairy. You can see that on, on the screen. Uh, they're, they're very hairy and those hairs actually are electrostatic. So they attract pollen grains so that when a bee lands on a flower, the pollen comes to her. Uh, bees have stiff hairs on their legs so they can groom the pollen off of their body and hold it in specialized pockets on their body. Bees tend to be true also to flower types. So they visit one kind of flower and then another of the same kind and another of the same kind, which is great for uh, flower cross-pollination. When we think of bees, many people think of honeybees. So honeybees probably get more press than they should. Uh, and that's because there's, there's just a few species of honeybees, but there are 20,000 species of bees in the world. We have 4,000 species here in North America and here in Missouri, where, where I am, there's 450 species of bees. And when we think about that compared to honeybees, like I said, there's only a few, there's seven to 11 species, recognized species of honeybees worldwide. But here in the US, we really only have one species of honeybee that um, is the honeybee of choice. And that's Apis mellifera. Oops. So for example, when talking about the diversity of all of those native bees, um, or the great diversity of all the bees that are out there, uh, we have these two charts. These, these actually are from uh, the uh, Forest Service. Um, they have the bumblebees of Western US and also the bumblebees of the Eastern US. You can see so many different kinds of honeybees, or of, you can see so many different kinds of uh, bumblebees that are out there. So we have some that are large, we have some that are small, we have various colors that are out there. And some of them are, they're going to uh, live in different habitats or different niches. So the honeybee though, it's, it's a pollination poster child. <laughs> um, and why is that? Well, it's been studied for over 200 years. These are eusocial bees. That, that means something very specific when we talk to uh, an entomologist, I, I'm an entomologist, and it means that they, they'll live together. There's, um, a, we, have a, we have different caste systems. So we have a queen and we have workers and, um, and we have drones. And then um, they, they have overlapping generations. So there, there's a unique class of insect um, compared to most insects that are solitary. And so with our honeybees, we can, we've actually convinced them to live in this box and it's transportable. Um, so that's why we call them domesticated. They're, they're not domesticated like your dog, but they're a wild animal, but um, we're able to keep them um, and, and harvest from them. So typically honeybees are kept in this, this square or cube-like box. It's, that's called a Langstroth hive. There are other kinds of hives. You can see back here, there's one that's, that's a, a long hive or a top bar hive. And um, there, there are some other kinds, but these are probably the two most familiar. And usually you might see these painted in white or another bright color. We love honeybee products. Uh, we, we love honey and beeswax and propolis. Uh, we love their pollination services. They help make a lot of food for us. Their social lives fascinate us from the waggle dance and their ability to communicate where a rich source of pollen or nectar is located. They can communicate that to their sisters. And then honeybees, really truly, they are still, they are still so sophisticated. We're still learning about all the different ways that, that they interact with one another. And while these bees are the most prolific honey makers, they make a great pollination poster child. And we'll be talking more today about native bees instead, but we'll also talk about why we're mostly talking about bees. Um, and it's because <laughs> they're the ones that, that are our key pollinators. And so we're gonna talk about how to protect them and how to increase native bee habitat. 
So first let's compare honeybees with our native bee species. So if you look at this, you can see some of this I've already told you, um, honeybees, 70 to 11 species compared to 4,000 species here in the US or 20,000 worldwide. We have uh, honeybees, they produce honey, but native bees are, well, they're not eusocial. They don't really produce honey. Most of them are solitary. Most of them live in the ground compared to the honeybees that are in, in this hive. Um, honeybees, they really, when they, when they have a flower, they really get into it. They just get into this one. Whereas a lot of our native bee species, they, they go from flower to flower to flower really fast. And, and so that, that changes the, how, how well they pollinate. Um, I guess I, I could give you a spoiler. It's, it's actually the um, native bees that, that actually are better at pollinating flowers, typically. Um, our, our honeybees are very well studied, but our native bees, they're, they're not very well studied. There's so much we don't know about them. Um, we have our honeybees, poster child for pollination. Um, and again, our native bees, we just really don't know a lot, but something that is very common between the two of them, they're both in decline. So let's, let's talk about that. All right, so why are bees and, and other invertebrates in general, why, why are they in decline? And it boils down to these three things, loss of habitat, pesticide use, and invasive species and diseases. So what is, what's up with habitat, habitat loss? So we've, we've lost habitat. We've lost it in quality and in quantity. People have moved to the cities. Um, big farming is where much of our food comes from in order to grow lots of food efficiently. Many acres of a single crop called monocultures are grown. So what used to be small acreage farms with a lot of variety, it's now acres and acres of the same crop. Even if it's a crop requiring pollination, just like you're advised to eat the rainbow, nutrients from multiple sources are necessary for the pollinators to be able to get all the nutrients they need. So additionally, these, these really large acreage farms, they break up the habitats that created or that connected to each other um, in, in the past. And so insects actually have to travel farther to access food that is lower in nutrition, and then they have to go all the way back to their hive or nest. So pesticides, obviously this, this is included. Pesticides killed things, often insects. Uh, the invention of pesticides were initially a boon to farming as much of our crops, are, they're lost because of destructive pests. So killing off the crop pests allowed for greater yields and efficiency. However, this came at a cost. So you may have seen this book, um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Uh, she documented the adverse environmental effects caused by the way insecticides were used indiscriminately. So in, environmental conservation was born, DDT was banned for agriculture use, and the US created the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's important to recognize that agriculture pests are a real problem we do need to find ways to deal with the huge and sometimes devastating losses that can occur. However, killing our beneficials along with the pests is also devastating and it will make a bad problem worse if we don't find solutions. So this problem is compounded by knowing that we know so little about our native bees. Our honeybees live in hives and beekeepers can see the direct impact of pesticide contamination events. But most of our native bees live in the ground and we don't actually know how they're affected. We don't no, um, beyond, you know, they, they obviously are affected, uh, it could kill them, but death isn't the only way that bees are affected by pesticide. There can be sublethal effects such as decreased egg laying or decreased production or decreased coordination. And all of these can affect the overall health of insect populations. So we really need to do more research. There's also pesticide or parasites and diseases. You can see in this picture right up here, that is a mite. That is an in invasive species that has affected our honeybee populations. And it turns out it can affect some of our native bee populations, not, not in the same way because they have a, a symbiotic relationship with bees or honeybees, but they still can affect our other bees. So this is a varroa mite. Um, it's a hemolymph or insect blood uh, sucking parasite. So it's approximately like having a dinner plate sized mosquito feeding on you. <laughs> this this uh, mite was found in the U.S. in 1987, only 34 years ago, but its impact has changed the way beekeeping has occurs now. So you can't just 
buy bees and set up your hive and just let it go, uh, if you don't monitor it, it can act, you can actually be causing more damage than good. So why are the bee populations declining? We just talked about loss of habitat, pesticides, and the spread of invasive pests and diseases. So all of these things compound into a huge and potentially devastating problem. So I just gave you a pretty dark picture, but the reason I have to share this is because these are all parts of the bee's habitat and you need to know what they are up against so that you can do something about it. And yes, you can do something about it. And that's what we're gonna focus on now uh, for the rest of the presentation, what you can do maybe even today. Here you go. This is basically the rest of the presentation. Uh, create more food. You can plant more flowers. You can create more nesting sites. Uh, leave some bare ground undisturbed. Leave areas where the leaves can remain whole and undisturbed. Uh, and leave plants in place uh, at, at the end of the season and let them stay in place through the winter. And then uh, if you have to cut them, um, then just leave them, leave them there. And that allows for more habitat. Uh, and then also practice IPM, which is integrated pest management. So let's look at those a little bit more closely. Uh, we have uh, planting more flowers. Uh, really any plants that you put out there, uh, any more flowers, it's, it's going to help. There are some that are gonna be a little bit better than others. For example, cultivated uh, versus native. Native uh, are, are better situated for our climate. Um, they can be better situated for our soil. If you live in an urban area, you might not have native soil, um, but, but typically they're gonna be better. Also, uh, if you look at this, we only have one set of petals here. A lot of our cultivated flowers have multiple layers of flowers or of the petals, which actually makes it more difficult for the bees and other pollinators to get to the nectar and the pollen. There's a resource right here, uh, Grow Native. They have a lot of top 10 lists that can help you find the, some native uh, plants that might be best for you. Um, I can drop that link in the chat in just a little bit. Uh, creating more food, again, planting more flowers. Um, when you're doing this, plant for year round blooms. Um, so in the early spring and, and in the summer and in the fall, these are some crocus that I planted in my lawn, like actually in my lawn, uh, so that they, they came out um, really early in the season before I'd be doing anything in my lawn anyway. And then I also have clover growing in my lawn. So I'm creating these additional food resources for, for my, um, for, the, for any of the pollinators that could be in my yard. And um, some people might not be able to do this. And actually, let me just show you a couple more and then I'll tell you, talk a little bit more about this. This is henbit. A lot of people consider this a weed, but it's actually a very important food source for, for pollinators, uh, especially the long-tongued uh, pollinators like uh, honeybees or, or bumblebees. Now, this is a video that I just took this afternoon. And you can see this is a little halacted bee that's, that's feeding on a dandelion. It looks like it's getting the nectar uh, right now. Um, if we go a little bit farther into it, let me see, I'll just go a little bit farther in. I thought this was, um, might get a little, yeah, it's gonna go away and then it's gonna land on a different one. And you'll actually be able to see it feeding on the pollen. Now, a lot of the people consider these weeds, um, but, but maybe they're not, uh, especially clover. Clover used to actually be some, thought of as, as a good thing to have in lawns. And I think it's, it's coming around that it is again. And so putting these things out in your lawn um, or allowing some of these weeds to be there, uh, they, they actually can provide a, a good food source um, in an area that, that normally just really serves very little purpose other than to just be green and beautiful. If you live in an HOA that you can't have um, some of these things in your lawn, then perhaps maybe put this in your backyard instead of in the front yard. Um, there, or there might be areas of, of your yard where you can, you can actually um, allow, allow things to get a little bit more messy than, than a, a very, very manicured lawn. Another thing you can do is create more nesting sites. And that means leaving some of the areas bare, leave, leave some of the ground bare. Um, a lot of these bees, 80% of bees actually nest in the ground. And so uh, if you put mulch on it, then they're not able to get in there and, and create their nests. 
You can also leave areas where the leaves can remain whole and undisturbed. So if you leave leaves on your grass, it will kill them. But you can move those perhaps to some of the areas where you have uh, your wildflower garden and then allow them to just be there. And, and the, the leaves actually create habitat where some insects may be able to be there or it creates a cover over the ground where the bees might be nesting and that provides a little extra protection from, from the weather changes. And then also leave plants in place through the winter or, or cut and leave plants with a pithy or hollow stem. I'm gonna give you one more tip because I get a lot of questions about this. Bee hotels, are they good? Um, maybe, but fresh stems are left out are actually better. If you do want to use a bee hotel, um, there are a few things that you need to do. Uh, you need to make sure you sanitize it every single year and put new material in there because otherwise what you're doing is you're creating a great place for parasites to get in there and to affect all of the other critters. Um, and so it's, it actually can do more harm than good. And then I want to end on, on this, uh, and this is IPM, so Integrated Pest Management. This is a slide that's put together by uh, the Entomological Society of America, and they they start with identify and monitor, but I actually like to start with, with number three, which is prevent. So if you are putting the right plant in the right place, you're gonna have healthier plants. And if you are trying to put in plants that, that have fewer problems, um, maybe they're uh, resistant to disease or to certain insects, then you're not going to have to do anything later. You're not going to have as many problems, but you do need to always be watching your plants. So if you do find some insects, make sure you identify them properly because you don't want to be applying something um, if you don't have to, because most insects are beneficial. In fact, 99% of them are beneficial or neutral. Less than 1% are, are actually considered pests. So make sure that you are finding out what it is that you have and then just determine whether it's actually a problem. So for example, in my vegetable garden, squash bugs are a huge problem. I have a zero tolerance for, for squash bugs because they will decimate the entire patch. However, uh, when I'm looking at my tomato plants, the tomato hornworm or the tobacco hornworm, um, I have a very high tolerance for them. I love the moth that they develop into. It's a hummingbird moth. Uh, and, and so I really love those. And so I share. I share my tomato plants with, with those. I plant enough that, that both of us can, can do fine. If you do get to the part where you do need to have action, there are a lot of things that you can do before having to reach for a, a a chemical spray. So uh, you might just pick things off and put them in a can of or a container of soapy water. Um, you might be able to use a horticulture oil or horticulture soap. There are a lot of things that you can do before you ever have to break out a chemical. And, and so then, then you're going to be able to just continue monitoring. So there's a lot more that we could talk about, but I do want to uh, give you a chance to, ha to have some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and um, stop my sharing and, and open it up if you guys have any questions. Okay, anyone just feel free to unmute if you have questions. This is kind of a weird question, but um, I heard that cockroaches are edible, so I don't know about squash bugs or, you know, these things you don't like. Can you turn them into food, even dog food or something? That's such an interesting question. It, it depends. Um, yes, uh, cockroaches can be edible, but they have to be reared in such a way that you're not going to spread diseases. Um, people here in the United States I, I don't think many people are actually using those for, for food, but they are using crickets. So I used to tell my kids that I would never eat an insect on purpose. We all eat insects. Every one of us engages in entomophagy um, because it's in our food. There's actual legal standards for the amount of insects that are in our food. I'm sorry if, if you didn't wanna hear that. Um, <laughs> It's almost lunchtime for some people, uh, but that's that's the reality. It's impossible for us to keep all insects out of our food. Uh, but uh, there there are people who are actually purposely create like growing crickets um, and and grinding them into flour and able to use those in in various foods. And I've had uh, cricket chips and I've had cricket uh, cookies that were just absolutely amazing, and I would highly recommend them. So. 
there, there are things that we can do, but they have to be grown in specific situation or, or conditions to, to be okay. Roaches have a lot, can, can carry a lot of diseases. Um, squash bugs, uh, they actually have a stink gland in them, um, which would be off-putting for most anything that wants to <laughs> try and eat them. Speaking of those squash vine bugs, what do you recommend with those? Because I have no tolerance for them either. They have destroyed a lot of my plants. So, well, squash bugs, um, I wish we had really great solutions for them. Unfortunately, they, they are a very tricky uh, insect to try and control. But uh, one of the things that you can do is you can plant a trap crop a trap crop a little bit earlier. And what a trap crop is, it's, uh, it's a type of plant that is even more attractive to the pest than what you are wanting to grow. And so there's, for squash, there's a, a variety called blue hubbard that seems to work really well as a trap crop for squash bugs. And so if you plant that about two weeks earlier than the rest of your crop, then you're going to be able to monitor this crop. Now, just having them out there and just because it's more attractive, it doesn't mean that you can just let them be. What it does is it allows you to see when they're coming in so that you can be aware and protect your other, other crops okay. um, sooner. That's yeah. not the only insect that bothers squash though. There's, there's also squash vine borer that you, you have to protect those, those stems as they're coming mm -hmm. on from, from the borer. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm not hearing any and we are at our time. Well, thank you so much, Tamara, for joining us today and for presenting this information. I know we're all getting ready to get going with gardening and it's really important that we have our pollinators to help us get our food. So it's exciting to have some tips and also to kind of understand why the pollinators are um, declining and what we can do to help prevent those problems. So thank you so much. And we will see you again, everyone in May. And starting in May, we will be meeting every Friday. And we have some fun things planned for that that we'll talk to you about on our first week back in May. So we hope that you will RSVP and join us this summer. And with that, we will wish you all a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. Thank you.